Good afternoon, everyone. I like the music. Um, I hope uh, you're not too hot sitting there. It's good to see the jackets are off. Um, what a great afternoon it is. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you to this keynote session um, where I'm going to be joined a little bit later by Bob Backish uh, from Viacom and from Constantine Ernst uh, from Channel One to really talk about some of the key issues that we're seeing in the entertainment and media industry uh, and particularly in the TV industry uh, in the next few years. So start off, what, I'm, what I'd like to do is to share with you some of the key findings um, from this year's PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, Global Entertainment and Media Outlook. Hopefully, uh, the outlook is familiar to many of you, uh, as it's something that we have been doing now for uh, 12 years or more. Um, and so what I'd like to do is just to share with you uh, some numbers that talk about the direction of the industry, uh, and then to really try to address what we see as some of the key issues um, and I know that our uh, eminent keynotes are also going to touch upon. So let's start off by looking at the TV advertising market. TV, the TV industry for a long time has perhaps been, uh, people have been saying, oh, it's on decline, this, that, and the other. But certainly as we look around the world, and these are global numbers, so some markets are going to behave slightly differently. But actually, overall, in fact, we see TV's share of total advertising actually on the increase. Now, it's important to realize that included with these numbers, within these numbers, are actually some digital advertising revenues as well. We're obviously seeing the TV industry begin to embrace social media, embrace new media, and as a consequence, beginning to pick up some ad dollars. So what we've done is to reallocate them into the place they deserve to be, which is in television. So we can see TV over the next five years actually holding its own and growing. Now, let's look at the major markets. Where is that growth coming from? Well, put very simply, obviously, the developing markets are a great part of that puzzle. Um, and we see uh, Russia, which is obviously the theme of uh, one of the, the, the themes of this year's MIPCOM, um, driving that growth and achieving something around about 15% growth compound annually uh, in total advertising. China at the same sort of level. What that means is, is that by 2015, China will basically overtake Japan as the world's second largest TV market in terms of advertising, and Russia uh, will become the fifth largest. So these two individual countries playing a significant part of global growth. But let's remember, a one percentage gain uh, in a market like the US or the UK, dollar-wise, actually contributes a lot to the industry. So while there is a story to be told about the developing markets, it's still important to get it right in the mature markets. On the consumer spending side, again, we see actually, t and this is largely uh, relating to pay television, we still see growth in that segment. A lot of that growth is being driven out of parts of Asia, Indonesia, for example, uh, India, uh, as well as Latin America. And so some strong growth there, and actually outpacing almost any other segment of the industry, say, for video games. Now, what's the story? So a little bit of context there in terms of some numbers. Well, what do we see as some of the key challenges for the industry? Well, at the end of the day, it's about how do we really continue to be relevant to the consumer, uh, and how do we get that true level of engagement with a consumer who, let's face it, is everywhere, right? They're no longer in one place. They're not sitting in their living room. They're absolutely everywhere, and they're kind of difficult to reach on a consistent basis. And we believe that, therefore, the skill of collaboration, who does the industry work with to help gain that sort of consumer relevance? And what I want to do is to examine that theme in three areas. The first one um, will be around talking about this digitally empowered consumer. Let's face it, we talk about nothing else. Um, but really trying to understand what, where is the consumer right now. Then talking about how the advertiser is reacting to that. And then finally, what does it all mean to us? So let's start off by actually talking about this digitally empowered consumer. The consumer has never had it so good. They can find almost whatever they want, wherever they want it, and increasingly it's free. So with that backdrop, what I'd like to do is just to play a short video, which really where consumers are talking to us about their consumption habits. Uh, and so let's play the video, and then we'll look at some of the key themes. So roll video.
First of all, 2009 seems like 1999 when it comes to technology. It's only two years ago, but it seems like a stone ages. Ich gebe auf jeden Fall mehr Geld aus für Leistungen als noch vor zwei Jahren, egal ob jetzt offline oder online. I don't tend to buy newspapers because I find it like always like too much content. So I'll, I'll definitely check the news online every day because it's just much easier to pick out what I want to read. I think the uh, the world is such at the moment. Everything's free if you want it. There's plenty of streaming sites and when one is shut down, there's another one pops up. Why pay? I have illegally downloaded each episode as soon as it uh, shows it airs in the USA. So if, if it showed here, I wouldn't do that. I would readily pay for that kind of content, but that content is not available here. Why do I see Netflix today? I don't Netflix. I don't understand it now. It's just that simple. Now I don't have cable anymore. I do have internet access, but I watch most of my television shows on the internet. I'd be very happy to pay, you know, like 20 quid a month for like those four channels that I wanted, but I'm just not paying 30 quid extra for like other stuff that I'll never use. The Netflix streaming is great because you can use it on your internet, on your computer, or like on my iPod I can watch it, or I can stream it through my Xbox or my Apple TV, so it's really useful. I have a, a, a PC hooked up to my um, home television in the living room, and I find that when I turn it on, I'm more inclined to open up YouTube or Hulu before I go through the channels. You watch, you know, football, basketball, golf, or anything like that. You can access highlights online. Uh, maybe you can, you know, do some type of a recap after the game is played. But you can't get those sports live yet. I know there are now ways of being able to stream movies in that quality to an actual TV set, but watching a movie, going into the other room and watching it on a PC is not something that I just feel comfortable with. I paid for my Netflix, and I feel like that the return on that investment is huge, um, especially because they're making the huge transition to make almost everything uh, streamable online. You pay a monthly subscription, you have access to a ton of music, but the minute you stop paying, you lose it all. I mean, it's the other que teniendo las cosas en datos, en discos duros, al final se pierde. Y entonces, las cosas que me gustan mucho, 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 sí me gusta tener físicamente. If I have it on my computer, I have it unless I lose my computer. So sometimes I like using a computer more because it's more permanent and I can back my things. So it feels safer. Ich glaube, dass ich auf jeden Fall, wenn ich die Möglichkeit habe, mich online mit der Marke auszutauschen, und auch äh, teilweise interaktiv mitzuwirken vielleicht äh, wesentlich mehr diese Marke nutzen werde. Moving from one platform to another, personally, I think it's fantastic. But it can be overwhelming in your face all the time, especially with marketing. Everyone being connected with us all the time, I think they, they're following us around now in our little phones. So that's what the consumer says. By the way, some great plugs there for Netflix, um, but also some frustration from that guy from Hong Kong who said, hey guys, just get the business models working. Um, so some interesting comments there from the digitally empowered consumer. Some of them, interestingly, are also conflicting because we have to recognize that actually there are different types of consumers, not just digital natives, but also digital migrants like me. Um, but they are the consumer is beginning at a time when they're saying actually they want more stuff free, they're also beginning to give us some hint as to what they actually might pay for. Um, and some of the things that we're seeing is really it's content plus something. It's not just content. Because if content is available over here free and over here pay, guess what? Like for like, you go for the free one. So in terms of differentiating the content offering, we believe that these are some of the areas that, that people are telling us uh, that they will pay for. They will actually pay for quality, right? They don't want to download something and give themselves a virus on their laptop, right? So they will pay for quality. They will pay for the convenience, and that could be 
um, the convenience of mobility, and we're beginning to obviously see that with the, with the explosion of smart devices. And they're also talking to us, obviously, about the overall experience. Give me an added value experience, you know, whether that's 3D, HD, you know, that helps to differentiate the product. But they're also telling us that they're willing uh, to participate and to pay for participation in content, either directly or indirectly. I mean, you know, if we just look at the success of you know, every single sort of reality show from Idol through to X Factor, it is part of that participation, that voting process, that again, not just creates prime time again, but also gets a participant participation element of the consumer. And the final thing that they're telling us is that they will pay for the privilege of seeing things and seeing things when their friends tell them. So in a world where we are all connected, and if I see something, say, in the US, and I'm talking to someone on my social network about it in Russia, people in Russia want to watch it. If it's not made available there, guess what? They tend to pirate it. That's just the way life is. Um, but clearly, if it is made available, people are prepared to pay for privilege. In the video gaming world, people are pre even prepared to pay to cheat. Right? You buy virtual goods to help you get to the next level, right? Isn't that strange? And so I think there are a number of lessons as to what the consumer is actually willing to pay for. So what about the advertiser? Well, you know, the advertiser, if you, again, think about where, what's happening to the consumer. The consumer is giving a lot more information about themselves. They are basically, where are they? They're in social networks. Um, and that means that for an advertiser, they're going to have to get a lot more involved. So what does this involved advertiser actually look for? There's some words on this slide which are not new words, but they, I would say that they mean new things. The advertiser is increasingly, I would say, getting down and dirty, right? They want to get in amongst the consumer. And where is the consumer? The consumer is in social media, and that therefore it is all about how to engage with these digital natives in their environment. That brings us, obviously, to the concept of much more personalized interaction. And remember here that the industry for a long time has survived off of selling space associated with eyeballs. Increasingly, it is going to be how do you monetize the more personal engagement? And that is a completely different skill. Um, but arguably, if you get it right, the, the value can be very high. Advertisers continue, though, to want to be associated with great, compelling content, whether that's sport, reality actually increasingly branded content. And I think we will see a lot more, uh, not just discussion at MIPCOM around branded content, but actually a lot more money going into that segment with significant implications for content providers. Finally, you know, again, we've talked about integrated advertising for years, but it means something different now. What it really means is cross-platform advertising. So if you think of, for example, you now, you open up any, you walk past a billboard, uh, or you're in a store, and there's that little 2D barcode, and you put your phone up, and it gives you information on your phone. This is much more about cross-platform advertising than it ever used to be. And you can begin to see that this advertiser is really getting into the consumer relationship, uh, and that, therefore, how we as a media industry react to that, and as content providers, uh, is obviously a significant challenge. We believe one part of the solution to that is around something that we call the collaborative digital enterprise. Um, and this is really our view of the media organization of the future. And we're already seeing it happen. It's around an organization that is very, very collaborative with other people, both internally and externally, in order to help them reach the consumer. Um, and we can think of some great brands out there that do this actually pretty well. You think of how, for example, Apple engage with the consumer. It's a very, very unique experience. But what we're trying to get to here is in order to reach the customer, you're going to have to work with people that perhaps you haven't worked with before. Um, and you're also going to have to approach some of the key areas, for example, of data mining in a different way. Now, what do I mean by data mining? Well, just think about this consumer. M most, most content providers have generally been in the business of what we call business to business, right? You make stuff and you sell it to a broadcaster. But increasingly, we're seeing content producers actually starting to have direct relationships with customers. They've moved from a B to B business to a B to C business. And those customers, those consumers, are actually giving a lot more information about themselves 
than ever before. They will tell you, me, if I'm asking, information about their habits, what they like, often in return either for free content um, or uh, actually as part of the social networking experience. So what we see is, is this constant need to evolve how we as an industry uh, react. And so all of this information that we're actually now receiving, we need to mine. There are not many media companies that have actually had a great deal of history in the mining of that consumer information because they've been B2B businesses. So we believe in addition to data mining, there are a couple of other real imperatives around uh, future success. One is, well, if you're going to give me all this data, you must, you must take care of it. And we've seen some obviously high profile examples this year of where data has leaked, uh, where it has been hacked. Uh, and therefore, making sure that as media organizations, we can demonstrate to our customers that we'll keep your data safe. But there's another aspect of that, which is consumers will get rapidly very, very angry if we misuse their data in a different way. If we start bombarding them with all sorts of marketing messages, they say, hey, stop. You're now abusing the trust. You're abusing um, the relationship. I've given you this information. Give me the stuff I want. Don't give me everything. Uh, and I think that's another important aspect of, of data security. We're also going to have to change the way we actually do things, which is designing content from the get-go for a digital consumer in mind. We all know that that is a different creative process. And that creative process is also deeply enmeshed these days, meshed with technology. Uh, and therefore, making sure that the content that we produce today can be exploited in days to come in a digital format. And that is creative and technology working hand in hand. And the final thing that, and, and certainly something that, that you know, the CEOs of the major media companies are telling us, in fact, 77% of entertainment and media CEOs interviewed just prior to Davos this year told us that their number one issue was around digital talent management, meaning this is a new breed of uh, employee who, let's face it, isn't going to work for one organization for, 50, you know, for 20 years. They're going to work for five organizations in five years. How do you deal with the needs? How do you find them? How do you find digital talent when most of it is being hived off into Silicon Valley by Google and others? So how do you actually find the talent? How do you retain it? And how do you remunerate it? And these, I think, are some of the key questions that certainly we uh, encounter when we're dealing uh, with major media companies. And we believe that the solution to many of those problems results in or is a, it really re results in an enterprise that is much more collaborative. We believe that those are the organizations that will actually prosper as we go forward to 2015. Now, that's the PwC view. Um, and that's our very high level um, sort of summary of our global entertainment and media outlook this year. But what I'd now like to do is, and for the remainder of this session, is to get the industry's view, and they will, may disagree with me, hopefully they won't, um, but I'd like to start off by, um, therefore, uh, welcoming on stage in a moment, Bob Backish, um, who actually doesn't need a lot of introduction because he is one of the uh, leading international uh, executives in the content arena. But before he joins us on stage, I'd just like to show this very quick video. <laughs> 